Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, we will start slowly but surely this uh, afternoon session on the cooperation between Data Protection Authority. Um, before starting, I would like to uh, thank you very much for being brave and, and attending this session instead of the very superstar session which <laughs> is taking place on the other side. Uh, I hope uh, we will provide you uh, useful and very interesting um, information about uh, this uh, cooperation and that we will have a, a really interactive debate and discussion not only between the speakers but also with the audience. So, as I said, uh, the purpose and the topic of this uh, session is about cooperation between DPAs. Uh, we really would like to explore these uh, challenges, uh, this ongoing cooperation, uh, but this time, and this is the specificity of this session, not from uh, the point of view of the DPAs, also for the moderator we will have a representative of a DPA, but from the point of view of the clients of the DPAs, uh, the stakeholder interacting with the DPAs. So we will try to provide you some illustrative examples uh, which will highlight uh, this famous uh, challenge, threats and opportunities regarding uh, this cooperation. Before that, uh, one word, or a couple of words about uh, my institution. Um, oh yes, by the way, I should have present myself. My name is Laurent Bellet. I'm working for the Joint Research Center, uh, which is one of the DG uh, Director General of the European Commission, um, uh, the biggest one, by the way. Uh, we are providing uh, scientific support uh, to our Brussels colleagues uh, in order for them to develop proper, adequate, efficient uh, policy. Um, and uh, we are spread all over Europe. We are roughly uh, almost 3,000 uh, scientists uh, working on various fields. I'm uh, belonging to, uh, I'm working on uh, the Institute for the Protection and the Security of the Citizen and more specifically for the unit on digital citizen security where we are exploring uh, through research projects uh, the privacy, security, uh, cyber security, cyber crime uh, impacted uh, the uh, EU citizen. Okay, for, for the session, uh, as I said, I'm chairing the session. As a moderator, we will have Gwendal Legrand from the CNIL, the French Data Protection Authority. Uh, he will intervene at any time, uh, and he will give a few words uh, right after me. And then we will go through this illustrative example, as I said. Uh, the first uh, presenter, David Wright from Trilateral, uh, will give you the main results of uh, uh, a project, uh, which aim was to study uh, in this cooperation. Then we will move to my colleague Ignacio, uh, who will give you a concrete example of a, um, a, a kind of a training exercise in order to improve and uh, enhance this cooperation. Uh, we will move then to the private sector, the industry, uh, with Emmanuel. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, the EU citizen, uh, Max, uh, will uh, share with us his experiences as a citizen. And, and regarding this uh, cooperation between uh, uh, DPAs. Okay, so now I would like to give the floor to Gwendal for a few minutes. Uh, I will be very brief, hello. Uh, I'm, I'm Gwendal Legrand, I work for the French Data Protection Authority and well, I'm not on the panel, I'm just the moderator because we're here to be some kind of consultants to listen to what uh, uh, our customers have to say about the way that we cooperate. Now, just to set the scene, because I'm not, I'm going to list a number of cases very briefly that our speakers are going to elaborate on, uh, and so you you really understand what we what we mean when we talk about cooperation. Uh, our understanding is that cooperation is not is can be about enforcement, of course, but it's not only about enforcement. We've had recent cases uh, where uh, DPAs have been uh, collaborating uh, on enforcement procedures, uh, for instance, uh, Google Street View, the privacy policy, uh, collaborating on, on different tools, things like that. So there will be examples uh, presented by uh, David. But cooperation is al also done on a daily basis, I would say, at the Article 29 level, uh, where we share information, uh, we define best practices, we explain how to implement the directive, and we produce opinions uh, to explain how to implement the law. So 
this is what cooperation is about. It's not only about uh, the enforcement procedures, uh, and I think this is uh, very important. Um, another, another thing, and maybe this is the reason why we're having this panel today, and this is uh, we uh, DPAs being the customers, I would say, of, of uh, the companies that come to us. Uh, uh, what I've heard many times since I, since I joined the CNIL is that I, I've seen many companies criticizing DPAs, saying, oh, I'm a big internet player or I'm a company operating in, in, in various uh, European countries. It's terribly difficult for me when I launch a new product because I have to comply with 28 uh, different national laws. Uh, I need to go and see different DPAs and they say different things. And, uh, and sometimes, to be honest, uh, uh, at least for some of them, what they forget to say is that they themselves say different things to the DPAs and present them in the, uh, present this in a scattered way to the different DPAs. And maybe for some of them, the strategy can be seen as divide to conquer. So uh, to, to what extent this is true, uh, we'll, pr we'll probably discuss this during the panel. Um, and, and what they also do when they come to us is they present the, the product, you know, in a very objective way and they say, oh, we presented the product to your colleagues last week and they said it was fantastic and they didn't see any, any issue with that and so on and so forth. Do you have questions? So you see that it's a way of going to see different DPAs, presenting the information sometimes in a different way and then obviously you get sometimes inconsistent responses by DPAs. Um, so, I mean, this, this problem we've identified pretty well over time, so to be more consistent and efficient, there's a lot of coordinated efforts going on at the Article 29 level. There's famous cases where we've been uh, working on an operational uh, level uh, with our uh, colleagues at the, at the Article 29 level. And when we do this, the companies sometimes say, well, it's nice to have a single con point of contact. Uh, it's nice to answer questions by the Article 29, but what's the national law? What's the basis? Why do you ask questions to us as the Article 29? So it seems that sometimes there's no adequate question, you know, in, in the way we address the companies, because if we do it at the national level, they say we, you have different answers. If we do it in a coordinated way, they complain because they say uh, law is being enforced at the national level and not at the Article 29 level. So that's, that's the scene more or less today. Uh, we cooperate, we do it for different activities. Uh, I think we've improved a lot since the Article 29 has uh, been created. Uh, is everything perfect? I don't know, so our speakers will respond to yeah. this. Uh, what, what should be improved? Well, the, these are the questions for, for our panelists, and with this I will pass the floor to David, who has been conducting a project called FIDRA exactly on that topic to get, to get a picture of the state of the arts of the way we cooperate. Oops. Okay, David, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, it's a mouse as well, for sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today I'd like to share the results of a project called FIDRA on cooperation and coordination between data protection authorities and uh, Next slide. Uh, no. uh, okay, okay, cool. Uh, but uh, what, I think I need to go back a little bit now. No, okay. Do it with the mouse or should I go back? Okay. Yeah, yeah, just go back a little bit. Uh, yes, okay, that's cool. So, uh, first of all, um, you know, I think we need to ask the question, why does cooperation between data protection authorities matter to the rest of us? And there are some different reasons for, uh, for that. Uh, the first is that um, data protection authorities are better able to protect our privacy by leveraging the scarce resources they have when they coordinate or cooperate. Um, second, their cooperation sends a strong harmonized message to those whom they regulate. And third, it helps to reduce uh, forum shopping. Um, there is a slight difference between cooperation and coordination, as uh, Gwendol was mentioning. Uh, coordination typically is used to um, uh, indicate data protection authorities' collaboration with regard to privacy enforcement actions, and cooperation is, is, uh, r relates to sharing best practices, staff exchanges, information exchanges, workshops, and so forth. 
So a little bit about the FIDRA project. Uh, it was a two-year project uh, which just finished a week ago. Uh, there were four partners, VUB, um, our hosts for this conference, Trilateral, my company, uh, Giotto, the Polish Data Protection Authority, and the Universidad Jaume Primero, uh, which is based in Spain. Um, we did different things. We um, investigated various case studies and international mechanisms for cooperation. We conducted some surveys and, and quite a few interviews. Um, we looked at the enabling legislation for DPAs. Um, we prepared the first draft of the global arrangement that was uh, adopted in Mauritius uh, in, in October. We conducted some uh, workshops and, uh, and the reports that we produce can be found on the website that you see here at the bottom. Um, amongst the case studies that we looked at, um, there were some case studies that um, considered the cooperation or coordination uh, between data protection authorities and Google Street View as a very good example of where there was a lack of coordination. Um, and then uh, s since then we've seen an improvement in, in uh, co uh, coordination between um, data protection authorities. There's a couple more examples uh, listed on this slide and there's more in um, the del first deliverable from the project. Um, I, I think it's important to say that data protection authorities have a variety of, of powers at, at their um, disposition for enforcing privacy. The snag is that not all da data protection authorities have the same powers. So the pa some powers are listed here, but not all DPAs have those. Um, we, in particular, looked at barriers uh, twor towards uh, cooperation between data protection authorities. And we, in, as a result of the surveys and interviews that we carried out, um, you know, these were the main uh, barriers that, that were frequently mentioned, the lack of resources, of course. Um, and, and, and in many cases, the enabling legislation for data protection authorities uh, has confidentiality provisions which um, restricted the, uh, the degree to which they could uh, share confidential information. Um, there were language differences, of course, between the, the data protection authorities. That was a factor. Um, many DPAs said they weren't always, especially the small ones, weren't always aware of what was going on um, by the larger DPAs. Um, nevertheless, uh, data protection authorities have made efforts to overcome those barriers. Uh, some of them are, are mentioned here. Um, the, the Global Privacy Enforcement Network um, is, is a really good example. The International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners is another good example of, of DPAs uh, cooperating. Um, there's various regional organizations. They've co uh, cooperated on these so-called sweeps, um, investigating various issues. Um, uh, uh, quite a few DPAs have memoranda of, of understandings to uh, facilitate cooperation. Um, Article 45 of the new regulation um, specifically refers to uh, encouraging cooperation between data protection authorities in Europe and third countries. It's different from um, the uh, data protection directive. And the um, global cross-border enforcement cooperation arrangement that was agreed in Mauritius last October is also a really good example of, of uh, efforts made by DPAs to improve cooperation. Um, we made uh, 15 recommendations in the uh, final FIDRA report. Uh, four of them are mentioned here. Um, you can find the rest on the, on the FIDRA website. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to say that a, a week ago when the first FIDRA project came to an end, a second FIDRA project began. Uh, the DG Justice uh, approved a second uh, FIDRA uh, project which will last for two years. Um, the focus is a little bit different. It will build on the first FIDRA project, but it's a little bit different to the extent that the focus is on European data protection authorities rather than global, as was the case with the first one. Um, we will be looking at um, how, how some of the provisions of the GDPR can be implemented in practice. Uh, we'll be doing a, uh, more interviews with data protection authorities, conducting some workshops, um, and the same the same projects, uh, same partners will be involved in that project. And you know, again, uh, I put the website uh, for more information. And that's my last one. Fantastic. I mean, I'm. <laughs>
had me even surprised. Thank you very much, David. Uh, um, we will take one, two questions uh, regarding this uh, first presentation. Something you would like to, to be clarified or elements of this uh, project uh, you would like to comment? Any questions from the audience before I ask the moderator if he has one, one questions? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes. I would really like to know where this painting comes from. Thank you, Max. <laughs> <laughs> so I, can, I, can I can say that this is not a painting by Botero. It's a painting by Picasso. It's called Two Peasants. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, after a presentation as, as stimulating as mine, maybe it helps to put you to sleep. <laughs> Thank you. I thought it was Botero. Uh, yeah, m m I will, since the, the room is not asking any question, I, I think that the project is very interesting. What I understand is that uh, the, the focus of the new FEDRA project is going to be cooperation with EU DPAs, between EU DPAs. Does it mean that it's uh, a much higher priority and that we're not mature enough at the, at the moment, uh, rather than uh, it could have been a, a project on cooperation with third countries? So what's, what's your view on this? Is it a, a finding of, of the first feeder project and is it the reason why the second one is focusing specifically on the EU level? Well, I mean, the first one did uh, uh, have a global focus and so we contacted data protection authorities from around the world. Um, but the, uh, I mean, with the, with the GDPR, um, we, you know, we thought uh, it would be more appropriate for the second FIDRA project to um, look more specifically on, on how some of the um, uh, provisions in the new legislation could be uh, implemented in practice. I mean, like the one-stop shop, the consistency mechanism, and so forth. So, um, you know, we, we, we will certainly um, make known the results of the, uh, of the second FIDRA project to DPAs uh, from around the world. Okay, so now we will move to the next presentation. Uh, you have the mouse, so you can directly do it on your sides, uh, which will provide you an illustrative example of a, a, a training exercise for, for the DPA, a promising one. Yeah. You can just start the presentation. Yeah. Hello, my, no my name is Ignacio Sánchez. I'm also coming from the Joint Research Center, same unit as, as Logan. And as he mentioned earlier, we are main focus is um, data protection, cyber security. Um, I'm going to present one of our uh, research projects. Um, that is the organization of a Euro pan-European personal data breach exercise. Um, this project is about data breaches. And we are all familiar with the con concept of a data breach, but in particular in this project, we are interested in those data breaches that have a cross-border dimension. That is, a data breach where the personal data that is compromised belong to European citizens, not from one member state, but for several member states. And we, we have seen lately in the last years many examples of this type of pan-European data breaches. For instance, in 2000, well, the, the first one for sure that comes to mind is, is the one of the Sony PlayStation that happened already a, a few years a, a, ago. But in the last years, we have seen others. They are becoming more and more common. In 2013, the one of Adobe, 150 million users worldwide, including Europe. The one of eBay last year, and there are many others. So that was the main motivation for us to, to, to do this little research activity. Because in order to create an effective response to this type of, of events, a collaboration among the several DPAs is required. And the main tool um, that is available in the, in, the, in the current and the forthcoming legislation is the notification of the data breach to the data protection authorities and ultimately to the individual. Because the purpose of this response to the data breach is to mitigate uh, the negative impact that this data breach will have on the affected individuals. If we, for instance, um, think about a pan-European data breach, the one of Adobe, if you had an account 
opened with this uh, data controller, your password and your email address uh, were compromised and were published online, were stolen. It is possible that you use the same password elsewhere and whoever is in possession of the password, and sometimes everybody can access that password, will be able to access other accounts. So this, the main purpose for the, um, for the, um, for reacting uh, and, and notifying uh, ultimately to the individuals is to try to mitigate, to try to tell the individuals that this has happened, they should change the passwords, they should be guided on, on what to do in order to mitigate this impact. And there are two types of notifications. The one that is uh, supposed to be sent by the data controllers to the competent authorities, and that must be done um, according to the, uh, to the forthcoming regulation. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Um, so this, this notification to the competent authorities uh, should take place within 24 hours. Um, and there is another notification um, that um, will be sent to the individuals concerned by the bridge uh, that will take place unless certain specific conditions uh, are met. So in this type of context, a collaboration among the DPAs is required to effectively uh, respond to this, to this data breach. In order to analyze the dynamics around this collaboration, to understand what are the challenges in this, in this collaboration, where we are, can we improve, what can we improve, we are using a tool that is, um, uh, is called a cyber exercise. So cyber exercises are well known for the security community. They come from the military, where they were called this uh, red team versus blue team. And uh, they are usually applied in the, um, by the security community. They, they can be, there are cyber exercises that are related to operational details, very low level operational details. There are others that are more about the coordination collaboration, and there are others that are at a strategic level, top level, so we are targeting the one in the middle. Um, it is not the first time this uh, cyber ex exercise is uh, used as a tool uh, in Europe to promote collaboration. Um, that is the case for the Cyber Europe that uh, took place for the first time in 2010 and uh, more recently in 2012. This is a cyber exercise in the context of critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure and, uh, and network. And uh, where there are um, uh, many, many member states participated and it's a very massive uh, exercise of massive scale. What we are going to do now is we are going to apply this concept of cyber exercises to the privacy community around data breaches and the concept of notification and collaboration in the response to this data breach. But since it is the first time, for us this is a research activity, um, we are going to to, to do it with, um, with a group of DPAs, seven DPAs that volunteer for this, for this activity. And for us, the main purposes, um, the main objectives of this, of this research is first of all to observe the current practices uh, for the handling of pan-European personal data breaches incidents in terms of existing procedures and the flow of information among the several stakeholders involved. And secondly, and also very important, to increase the preparedness, and we do that we do that by training over simulated situations, and this is the reason for the motto at the beginning, so we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. Um, and the idea is that we simulate a realistic situation, a realistic pan-European data breach, and by practicing over that simulation, we will be, the DPAs, will be better prepared to collaborate when responding to an actual breach of this nature. And Finally, and, and um, the most important one, is that the objective here is to promote collaboration, not only in the execution of the, of the simulated exercise, but also in designing the exercise. We are already, um, we are already seeing um, um, how this is helping to, to promote the collaboration, identifying issues, and, and putting forward uh, measures. So right now we are in the middle of the project. This uh, was a two annual project. Um, we're about to finish. Um, sorry, we're about to finish the second phase. So we uh, already agree on the operational details, how this uh, exercise be conducted, how the simulation will take place, how it will be played, uh, and we also agree the details of the scenario that will be simulated. And um, this simulation is supported by the same 
framework, technological framework, um, where the Cyber Europe was, was built. It's, called, uh, it's a tool, it's called Exito, it supports uh, the simulation of websites, injection of emails, injection of events. So we are finalizing now um, this uh, simulation of the scenario, and the exercise itself uh, will take place uh, later on this year, uh, and we will, we will publish the, the results on the, on the report. And so far, um, we have already identified some of the potential challenges that we would like to observe, we would like to, to put to test in this simulation. And we identify things such as how a DPA becomes aware of the existence of a bridge. Is it because it received a formal notification by the data controller? Is it because there is a proactive monitoring of the media and there was a news article about this? Is it because there was a complaint of a user? Or maybe a DPA was informed about the existence of the bridge by another DPA that knew about it before. And um, sometimes the identification of the data controller requires further collaborative analysis. It might not be obvious who is the data controller in the event, for instance, that uh, DPA or becomes aware of the bridge because there is, a, there is um, some stolen data published online. It's a dump of a database where, Im where um, there are email addresses of European citizens, passwords, credit card numbers. Sometimes uh, the identification of this data controller um, is part of the analysis. Then there is also the identification of the cross-border nature of the bridge that sometimes might require the analysis of the data. Uh, collaboration might be required because of the fragmentation of the information. Not maybe mm, a particular DPA will not have access to the full information about the bridge, might need to contact the North DPA, and a collaborative analysis must be, must be done in order to to identify these details. And uh, this is also a very important one. How will the communication between DPAs will take place? So if they have to exchange evidence about the bridge, how are they going to exchange that, uh, this data in a secure way? Um, so maybe there are, not, there, are not, there are not procedures in place. They may, maybe if it happens tomorrow and they have to do it, they will spend a lot of time trying to agree on a way to exchange this data in a secure manner. So this is also an important element we like to analyze um, in this simulation. Then obviously the notification to the individuals, that is the ultimate goal of the exercise, and a collaborative, a whole collaborative investigation of the, of the event, taking into account, as it was mentioned earlier by my colleagues, that in many cases the, informa the information is fragmented, the information provided by the by the data controller. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio. We can take uh, one question from the audience before we move to the next speaker. Something you would like. Uh, the result of the exercise will be published and okay. available. Uh, very soon after the that was your question no no oh, okay. i will i will jump in if there's no question from sure, sure, apparently sure, sure, sure. because no one's ready what's what's the level of uh, do you know what the level of maturity uh, uh, concerning the, the formalization of the processes is right now in the dpas and uh, do you think that the existing opinion uh, listing the use cases with different data breaches and the way to react to this that has been published recently by the Article 29 Working Party is sufficient. I mean, before you did the exercise, of course, you, you will have probably a different view after the exercise, but what is your impression right now? Yeah, um, yeah. precisely the purpose of the exercise is to try to answer, answer these type of questions. So, um, uh, because for us the exercise is a tool to analyze the dynamics around. Uh, for sure we have identified uh, some areas where um, that they are not very much in the collaboration um, and for sure this will help uh, the existence of this information but I would say it's too early to, to jump into any conclusions um, uh, so far we have identified where we suspect the problems are and this is what we call the key elements of the exercise the scenario and um, we'll put our suspicions to test uh, and we'll see what comes what comes out of it so then we can move to the Point of view of oh, th thank you, David. The, the point of view of the industry, uh, Emmanuel, the floor is.
Yeah, please. thank you. Thank you, Laurent. So uh, I would start with a little uh, disclaimer, you know, since I'm sitting next to a data protection uh, authority uh, representative, uh, all what I'm saying is uh, is just for discussion, you know, and, uh, and uh, of course, I uh, should not be taken as pure criticism, and I feel all the more comfortable that I, I used to work for the French data protection authority before. So um, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, uh, it's, uh, you know, things that I've lived uh, being now on the private sector side, uh, uh, and uh, which indeed um, sometimes uh, may be seen as uh, challenges that we are facing uh, as companies uh, trying to implement uh, processing all over uh, Europe. Um, so, of course, um, having said that, I mean, I think we can come back now to the typical situation that a data protection officer or anyway any company uh, would uh, face, you know, uh, when uh, processing personal data. Nowadays, of course, um, it's useless to uh, say that with globalization, most companies are uh, centralizing their databases, that they are trying to deploy some projects which implies processing of personal data all over Europe and not to say also all over the world. Um, and therefore, I mean, uh, the most of the time needs to make sure that when deploying projects implying processing of personal data, they will be compliant with data protection law, of course. And therefore, make sure that they understand what are the local requirements, what are the local constraints uh, imposed by law and also by the doctrine from uh, the data protection authorities. So um, the challenges here that uh, we face when we are in, in such a situation, for instance, let's imagine that you are a company and you want to deploy a whistleblowing policy or uh, that you want to implement a policy for uh, uh, you know, um, organizing the surveillance of your employees or also that you want to deploy a new tool which would enable to uh, track uh, your customers' activities and that you want to implement this uh, in the different uh, European countries. Well, the first challenge uh, you would uh, first, uh, you know, face, of course, is the difference of competence and of powers of the data protection authorities. Unfortunately, you know, nowadays uh, it's true that uh, the, when you go to see one DPA, uh, you are not sure that he will not have that he will have the same competencies as. The, the DPA next door, you know. Uh, so it's very important, first of all, to have this in mind, is that all over Europe, data protection authorities may have different powers, powers to issue guidance, powers to, uh, you know, also make audits on site of the company so that the risk for you as a company may differ, uh, powers also to investigate uh, a priori the notification uh, that you will be uh, placing uh, before the authority. And therefore, I mean, it places the company in a very um, difficult situation, I would say, in order to anticipate really what kind of expectations uh, will have the different data protection authorities. Again, you know, for instance, when you take the CNIL, there are a lot of guidance which are issued on what are the expectations of the authority. Very precise, giving a lot of uh, detailed, uh, you know, uh, criteria uh, that needs to be respected for a company to be compliant when deploying a certain type of processing. But when you go to another DPA, um, I won't quote anyone, any of those, but still there are many DPAs which are not issuing, uh, you know, very precise guidelines and you will need only to, to rely on the black letter of the law which will put you in the cloud if I can say um, and, and you will not be really you know um, being able to anticipate what will be the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the obligations that uh, you should respect at local level. So that's a very important point that you need to have in mind and in the, in the second part of my uh, presentation I will uh, uh, try to give some uh, you know, uh, tricks or at least uh, advice on how maybe to tackle this difficulty uh, of having different approach, different uh, um, yeah, requirements at local level. Um, I think one very important thing as well to have in mind uh, when you are uh, a company trying to deploy um, processing all across Europe is also to bear in mind that data protection authorities in Europe do not have the same resources. Some of them are very well staffed uh, and some of us are, you know, have very uh, 
poor uh, budgets, they have limited um, uh, people. So everyone is really, I think, in the DPA willing, of course, to enforce the law uh, as good as it can. But still, I mean, the reality is here. Some of the DPA do not have uh, enough resources. And therefore, uh, you know, the way they will be able to address uh, the, the any question you will raise to them uh, will really depend, of course, on their internal resources. And this is something also you need to have in mind because it may, of course, have an impact on the timing uh, for getting an authorization, for instance, or an answer uh, from a data protection authority. And this, I miss, this may have a, an impact on the timing, uh, you know, on the rollout of your, uh, of your uh, process within the company. So that's something very important to take in, in, into consideration is that on one hand you have legal uh, constraints, you have different types of powers from the authorities, but you have also um, uh, different uh, type of resources, which of course may have an impact uh, on uh, the responsiveness of the authority, and therefore in the end have an impact on how your uh, company may be able to deploy, uh, you know, a process which will be uh, done everywhere in Europe. So that's uh, really, you know, I think the, the two main challenges that uh, a company may face. So now how to, uh, you know, anticipate it, how to uh, tackle these challenges and uh, uh, try to uh, remain compliant while having to comply with many different uh, situations at local level. The first advice uh, that I would give is prepare your top management uh, for delays, you know. Don't create too much expectations uh, to uh, your top management in terms of responsiveness and in terms of deployment of a processing. Because for sure, there will be one or two countries where the timing for getting a prior authorization for transfer or for a specific sensitive processing will delay considerably the timing for a deployment of your processing of, of your project. So this, this needs to be uh, really taken into account and an alert needs to be ma make, made sorry, uh, within your organization. The second advice, of course, is that taking into account that one from one country to another one, uh, you may have different approaches, you know. Of course, what we usually do uh, in order to be able to uh, make sure we are effectively compliant with all local um, obligation is to conduct survey. Uh, you know, rely, uh, relying on a network of experts within your organization or if you are working with a law firm, relying on, on the network of the law firm in order to uh, create a survey which will enable to have for a specific type of processing, you know, to have the vision as to what is accepted, what type of conditions you need to implement in order to make the processing compliance, what are the notification or prior authorization requirements, how long it will take, uh, how much it will cost, because some of the DPA as well are uh, making uh, the notification or the request of authorization uh, for free, some others not. So that's something also important to take into account when you are uh, conducting uh, you know, uh, a project internally. The, the third advice, of course, is that once you have uh, you know, uh, the conclusion of the survey, once you have the visibility, of course, again, and I'm repeating, you, it will be clear, uh, it will be stated <coughs> on the paper that uh, you have uh, different uh, rules that you need to comply. Some will be very stringent, more stringent than others. Some will be very flexible and you will be able to deploy your processing very quickly. Then you need to draw the conclusion from it. What do you do? Do you do a global policy, for instance, which will then you know, uh, be a one suit fits whole, or will you have to make some local uh, provision for, uh, you know, your policy, meaning you will have one policy for Italy, one policy for Germany, one for Poland, one for France, etc., one for Belgium. And I think this is something very uh, important to ha have in mind, and it's a, a consideration as well to, to take into account is, do you intend to deploy a global approach, or are you ready to have some flexibility at local level? Personally, I think that if you want to um, uh, normally uh, be uh, able to deploy effectively a, a group policy or to implement a new project at group level, the most effective way, of course, is to make sure that you have a one-fits-all uh, solution. And therefore, um, your, question, your next question should be, how do you uh, handle this case if you have different legislation applicable and different constraints? 
Well, here, uh, my suggestion, and that's uh, something I tried already to apply internally, was to uh, take, of course, the most stringent approach so that you are sure that on one hand, you will make the data protection authorities happy, if I can say, because they will know, they will see that you are uh, you're not, not trying to lower down the level of protection you are bringing into the processing of personal data. On the other hand, you will also make uh, either your employees, if you are processing, if the, the, the project at stake is concerning employees or your customers, if it's about customers' personal data, you will make them more happy because they will know that you are a company uh, trying to uh, make the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, of, um, the personal data, of the personal data provision and therefore they will feel more comfortable. So that's something I think the, the, the very important as well to, to take into account. Of course, the last uh, advice that I could give is about, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, keep the dialogue uh, and tr being transparent with the authority. Uh, you know, being transparent with authority is something uh, that sometimes companies that I advise are, uh, you know, quite reluctant. They feel that once they will ask a question to the data protection authority, it will be put up front and that then it will create too many uh, questions and, and uh, uh, issues from uh, uh, um, the personal data protection point of view, so they prefer to hide, deploy the process, and wait, you know. And I think it's really something that needs to be avoided uh, in order to improve the, uh, the, the cooperation, because here we speak about cooperation between data protection authorities, but I think it's important as well to uh, consider the cooperation between the companies and the data protection authorities. That's something also uh, from which we have to learn uh, on both sides, if I can say, of, of the law. Um, well, I mean, I know uh, my time is uh, now counted, but I'd like to um, uh, give a final word on, uh, I think, a success story, um, or at least something which uh, is uh, uh, currently uh, drawing the path, has been drawing the path for uh, the new regulation, you know. Uh, you may already, of course, have heard about the binding corporate rules. And you know that for the adoption of binding corporate rules, you have a kind of cooperation procedure which is implemented. And the idea of this cooperation uh, procedure when it was adopted was clearly to smoothen the way uh, data protection authorities would adopt and would recognize the policy as being uh, fully compliant. So this uh, mutual recognition procedure works as follows. You have to designate a lead authority which will be the key contact point, if I can say, of a company. This key contact point will be making a first review of the binding corporate rules. So you could apply basically the same to any processing, but here it's for the binding corporate rules. It will explain to you and you will have back and forward discussion with the, 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 the lead authority in order to make sure that what you are developing is compliant with their expectation. Then in order to uh, make sure that, you know, uh, the review is not made too quickly or that there is not any mistake from this lead authority, the lead authority rely on two other data protection authorities which have one month to give their feedback and to, um, you know, raise any points that the lead authority may not have, have uh, seen. And then, once the three authorities have agreed, it is uh, the, the BCR are circulated all uh, around the different data protection authorities and they are considered as being validated. So it saves, uh, you know, sometimes to make sure that uh, you have um, only three DPAs reviewing uh, one uh, document, you know, instead of uh, having one, uh, each data protection authority reviewing one single document. So that's something that clearly, you know, the one-stop shop uh, that inspired uh, the data protection regulation that we may uh, speak about uh, maybe in, in the conclusion. Uh, and I think that's something we need to keep in mind is that data protection authorities have made a lot of uh, gain uh, in terms of improving the cooperation together. Uh, the BCR is a very good example, and I think that the next step would be to apply this kind of conception to all uh, t type of processing. My conclusion would be about uh, that there is, that there is still, I mean, although we speak about cooperation, about, uh, you know, having one-stop shop, etc., there, in one still, uh, there is still one thing which we will never get uh, rid of. It's the culture, the difference of culture. Data protection is about, you know, uh, us as citizens, us as human beings. And of course, there will always be some kind of different 
uh, you know, way of approaching privacy and data protection. So although we will have one single document, one single uh, data protection authority, which will be the key contact, it's very likely, I guess, that uh, the, uh, each data protection authority will keep its own uh, cultural approach, and this will still need to be uh, taken into account in the approach. Sorry. <laughs> If I no was problem. Uh, there will be no burning questions. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, we will have uh, some time at the end after the last speaker uh, to have uh, this interactive session uh, we are all looking for. Uh, so, yes, the floor is yours, Max. Can you yes, just I, I will switch. Okay. So um, last speaker, but not least, <laughs> the voice of the citizen. Oh, it's, I don't know if I'm the voice of all the citizens. Um, pretty much what, what we experienced is, is this one-stop shop already, because um, to my understanding, we already have that today. If I have a complaint, in our case, against Facebook, I have to go to Ireland as an Austrian citizen. Um, so it was kind of interesting that now the one-stop shop is suddenly kind of a bigger problem than it used to be. Um, however, it is a still, still a big problem. Um, I never experienced any real cooperation between data protection authorities from the user side, because that is just not foreseen in the law. Um, so I could have contacted the Austrian DPA and could have complained about Facebook, but they would r have rightfully turned me down and said, go to Ireland, that's the place you got to go. Um, so my experience is not really about cooperation, but a lot about the differences in, in <coughs> countries. Um, the best example is probably the PRISM complaint, because we filed this exact same complaint in three countries. Um, what happened on the PRISM thing, pretty much what we argued is, in, I, the example here is Facebook, is that if I'm an Austrian user, I forward my data to Facebook Island, um, the data is then transferred over the Atlantic on the safe harbor to Facebook um, Inc. and they forward it to the NSA. And my basic argument was that there is no adequate protection of my data if there is mass surveillance on my data. Um, that was basically what the case is about. Um, what happened is that we kind of made the same argument in Ireland on Apple and Facebook. And they first said they have no duty to investigate complaints. Um, then we said that actually there is a must or a shawl in the law, which means you have to investigate. Then they turned back and said, nah, yes, we do have to investigate it, but now we think your complaint is frivolous because your legal argument is frivolous. Interestingly, we had the argument of the European Parliament at the European Commission and the Article 29 Working Party, and the, apparently in Ireland they're all frivolous, um, which tells you how much sometimes Article 29 documents are helpful for in individual countries. In Luxembourg, they went the other way and said, ah, there is not enough evidence that they participated in PRISM. We don't believe what Snowden said, so we're out on the factual level, not on the legal level. They then backflipped and went back to the legal level in the procedures, um, but that was that. And Germany is still investigating Yahoo for two years, I think. Um, so that was the response in different countries. Um, if you take out Ireland, that's the Irish DPC. I guess that picture has been around uh, more than enough. Um, the little blue entry here is the current DPC, it's like in the middle of nowhere. Um, we had the trouble with the may and must, and um, the letters we got pretty much said there might be four different reasons why we, turned, we were turned down, not specifying which reason it was, so that was our kind of fun um, back argument on it that apparently not even the DPC knows why they turned us down, and um, because in Ireland there's not really any procedural law, we couldn't really get them to tell us why we were turned down, so um, we took a kind of amusing take on it. Um, the problem we had in Ireland, first of all, is that I do have a right to privacy under the Irish Constitution, but the big problem was I'm not an Irish citizen. And in Ireland, there has never been any ruling that this also applies to non-Irish citizens, European citizens in the ca this case. Um, so you start on these really basic problems. Second problem was to find lawyers. There were tons of lawyers, tons, probably four or five in Ireland that really know data protection law, and all of them tell you as a citizen, it's really great what you're doing. I love what you're doing, but don't tell anybody we've ever talked to each other, otherwise I lose all my clients. Um, so as a normal person, you don't even get a lawyer in a foreign country that would defend you. In our case, in Ireland, we had an asylum lawyer taking the case on the condition that I'm writing all the drafts and all the submissions. Um, so I was writing him a speech to the court that he was reading out to the judge in the end, which was the only way to even get it, which as a normal citizen, you obviously can do. Um, the lawyer we had in, Lux in Luxembourg, we took us a couple of days as well to find any lawyer representing us, and that was really taking out the whole privacy network that I have, all the privacy experts I know, you know, people living in Luxembourg to find someone. The lawyer we had um, apparently got drunk or something else the day that he should file the filings against the Luxembourg DPC, and therefore missed the deadline. And um, you can only be represented by a lawyer, um, so we couldn't file anything in Luxembourg. That's the actual reality. 
In Luxembourg, we also had the money problem, and officially they should have legal aid, but I was also turned down because I was not a Luxembourg citizen. The Bar Association of Luxembourg has never answered the legal aid request. Um, so as a normal person, and I don't even consider myself as a normal person, because um, if you're a lawyer, you speak English, you have much ahead of an average European, um, you don't even, you're not even represented in another country, um, let alone getting legal aid. We were lucky because we had crowdfunding and we were out in the media so we could get the funding and all that, um, which as a normal person you can never do. Um, the whole thing then turned to the high court in Ireland where you had a judge that has never heard about privacy before, but politically he thought what you're doing is a cool deal, but he doesn't really want to answer it and it's a hot potato, so he jumps it up um, to the ECJ and you're there after one year which was kind of an interesting experience, but if you look at it, it's like practically impossible for a normal person to do that. For miracles, I don't even understand myself, we're now at the ECJ with the case, um, but it's not really something that would usually happen. Now, the PRISM case was a very political thing, a big thing, a major issue, which is probably not your normal case you have on a daily basis. Um, but even if you look at the normal cases, so to say, you're back at the Irish DPC, and if you look into their statistics, after Billy Hawks, the last commissioner, took over, these are the curves of how many complaints they got and how many of them were turned down. You can see the turn down rate has pretty much identical to the amount of complaints they get. Um, in Ireland, two to four percent, it depends on the year, of the complaints are even investigated, all the others are turned down and not leading to any decision. Um, all these people, we had about 600 on Facebook, Everybody of the people that insisted that they have a right to get a decision in Ireland were sooner or later told that they're frivolous and vexatious and turned off. The only way you can appeal against it is a very expensive administrative procedure in Ireland. You're talking about up to 100,000 euro if you lose the case against the Irish DPA. So no average citizen would ever appeal against um, the local data protection authority there. Um, the biggest problem we have, um, yes, all of them were frivolous in the end. And we had about 200 complaints at the European Commission against the Republic of Ireland for not enforcing all these wonderful privacy rights we should actually enjoy. And none of that has really led to anything. Um, rumors say that this is because of the data protection reform where you don't want to mess with the member states too much, which I personally understand I wouldn't do either. Um, but that is kind of the reality we see. This is not necessarily an Irish problem. Um, we had the same, is um, same issues in Germany. We had the same issues in Sweden where complaints were turned down without any, without any reason. Um, and the underlying problem is really the procedural law in member states. Um, most of the member states don't have any procedural law. Um, you don't know what your rights are before a data protection authority, plus no one has ever done that. So for example, when we try to appeal against the Luxembourg data protection authority, there is something like a lawsuit for annulment for the decision, but no one has ever done that before. So the question was, do you even have a right to sue them? Um, so you're really talking about these very basic things. Um, interestingly, for example, in Ireland, I was told that Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights, a fair trial, doesn't apply to the Data Protection Authority there. Um, when I asked why that is, the answer was we couldn't tell you. But, for example, we didn't even get the files in the Irish case. We're not allowed to see the evidence in our own case, um, which is all things you could possibly appeal. But in a foreign country, even if you have funding and you have the knowledge, it's basically impossible. Um, what the the other um, approach we were taking, which I think makes much more sense from a um, data subject's perspective, is civil law. Because usually you're a consumer, so you can sue in your home country. And we did that in a class action against Facebook, which was filed at a Viennese court, which is, of course, much easier because it's two subway stops from where I live. Um, we went in on injunctions, damages, and unfair enrichment in this case. Um, Austrian procedural law allows that other people assign their claim to one person which we did, and we got 25,000 people joining the claim, which was kind of an interesting thing. We had to turn it off after six days because it was just too many people joining the case. The whole thing is um, financed by a procedure financing company that gets 20% share if we win, but takes all the costs if we lose. Um, and that's how it looked in practice. That was a web app where you could log in with Facebook and assign your claim and join the class action that way, which um, sounded like something that works better, like all these complicated stuff in a civil class action was easier to do than going through the data protection authorities as a normal citizen. Um, I think collective enforcement is in the end going to be the big thing to really get your rights enforced. Um, that is something that's also partly in the new regulation. Um, for the problems that I see, we have really this one-stop shop versus consumer. Usually we always think the consumer's country should govern all these issues, but of course you want to have a one-stop shop, which I think is very reasonable. Um, and this is just the conflict that um, 
you hardly overcome, and you have the difference between high-level and low-level cases. Of course, the safe harbor thing, I'd rather deal with the DPA in Ireland directly, while when I have a low-level case, like an access request, I might want to deal with my local authority because I can speak the language and stuff like that. Um, so the solutions we pretty much have in the room is like a DPA as a post box that just translates your complaints and forwards it to Ireland or whatever, which I think for average cases might help a lot. Because, for example, against a Spanish company, I couldn't even file a complaint because I don't speak Spanish. Um, then there is the like, idea of multiple DPAs, which is very interesting because, for example, on procedural rules, what is governing? If they make a joint decision under Austrian constitutional law, can I then appeal it in Austria? You know, stuff like that because um, it would be a decision by an Austrian body somehow. Then there's this idea of a decision on the European Union level, which I think is kind of interesting, but if you look the pro at the proposals, a lot of it g is going down to sending things to the ECJ, which is gonna be crazy, because there would be uh, just an enormous amount of cases going to the ECJ if you really do that. Um, and there's also the problem of time and, um, and appeals uh, structures there. Um, I think one thing that I see in the proposal from the council right now is setting up a lot of procedural rules saying you have to make a decision, you have to do ABC. The fun thing is all this should be in place in the member states. Um, just the reality shows that um, we're apparently not all on the same page on these things. And that is actually the biggest problem I faced in practice was procedural, precise procedural rules on how long does it take to have a decision, where can I appeal it, what has to be in a position, uh, decision, can I access my files or not. All these really basic things that should be around ever since the 50s are in the DPA scheme, just not there actually. Um, then you have this whole idea, what I think is kind of interesting is to split it in a way, to say civil procedures, we have this procedure already that you can file it in your home country, and then you have the DPA that follows wherever the company is sitting. That is maybe a solution that also works with the situation we have in the law already, that you have your civil claim that you claim with your local court against Facebook Island in this case, and then if you want to approach the DPA, that's like a second track, so you have like two tracks that allow different things. Um, and then there's this thing of collective enforcement and you really have NGOs that can collectively enforce the rights of a lot of people. You might be able to get these NGOs being able to really fight things in foreign countries as well. Um, but to f finish that whole thing up, from a European user side, there is not really any cooperation right now and I'm, I'm really interested in how this is going to be solved with the new law. Um, but the problems are there and they're like screaming. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, Max. Uh, now we are going to move into this interactive uh, part of the session. I hope uh, you have no questions in the light of all this uh, presentation. Uh, before the moderator, directly to the... Yeah, let's go to the room because we okay. have little time left. Yes, okay. Let me try with this microphone. Oh, I can go around. Please present yourself before raising a question. Okay, so I'm um, Marie-Charlotte Roquebonnet. I joined Microsoft four months ago. I uh, am the director of EMEA Privacy Policy. Uh, as Emmanuel there, I previously worked for CNIL. Um, I you know, had three comments to share and questions. And uh, the mindset here is really solution-making one. Please, we, we have 14 yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, it, it's gonna be I, really I short. I believe and trust you that you will be very So targeted. you're moderating so also. <laughs> please favor the question uh, yeah. more than the comments. Thank okay, you. Okay, yeah, it's really straight to the point. So if I can, I, I will go on. <laughs> so first comment was saying that, uh, you know, in the way we can collaborate as industry data controller with DPAs, uh, you know, the European Data Forum Governance um, consultation online was really a good step taken. So we shared some comments there. We observed that some DPAs do the same. For instance, Italy, Il Garante, uh, did so with biometrics. So first question is why isn't it occurring a little bit more on IT issues where you know the industry could bring some comments, not you know really impacting every time the decisions uh, m m done, but uh, maybe sharing. 
This is the first one. Second one, see, it's really quick. It's on the right to be forgotten. Uh, as you know, Bing is not really leading the market uh, in EU, uh, but Bing service exists, so we kind of sent a, a request to um, the Working Party 29 on the way to technically implement the right to be forgotten. And um, maybe some of you had noticed online that Working Party 29 answered to uh, Yahoo, to Microsoft, Google, and uh, uh, quant, I guess, uh, saying that we should abide by some guidelines and 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 put this, um, you know, uh, in uh, to enforce it. Sorry, online. But my question here it is uh, technically. Could we have some guidance? For instance, should we go to reverse IPs the way we do in China to partition the you know the access online? And the third question is um, maybe uh, one is counting really, really a lot, to my view at least. Windows 10 is going to be released this year. Um, we really want, or at least I really want, to uh, outreach DPAs beforehand, not afterwards. So what would be your suggestion here? Should I go and see, try to go and see all DPAs, or should uh, I proceed differently? What would be the basic step to take to be efficient? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the last one is a question for me. The question is, uh, how do you organize yourselves? There's different ways of doing it, and uh, we all know how you can approach DPAs. Uh, you, DPAs can be approached at the national level. They can be approached at the Article 29 level. Uh, so, I mean, this is, I think this is pretty well known. As for the delisting guida guidance, it's something that has been elaborated uh, collaboratively by all the DPAs, and that has been sent to a number of search engines uh, that had been consulted in the process. So uh, typically this is a case where there was some collaboration between the DPAs to explain how to implement a uh, decision uh, by the Court of Justice. And uh, so the first step was produce the guidance and second step was to send the guidance formally to uh, a number of stakeholders. The guidelines are a list of criteria that are used by DPAs to uh, explain how to implement the decision of the Court of Justice, how they are going to assess the complaints that they receive if people are not happy with the decision made by a search engine. It also explains a certain number of things on uh, to the scope of the decision, uh, if uh, information should be sent to uh, third-party websites, uh, the ones that are being indexed by the search engines and things like that. And uh, the, there's, the letter is clear with, that has been sent to the, to, the, to the search engines to ask how they're, what they're going to implement this and make sure that they uh, are aware that this guidance has been published. Just on a really short notice, um, as a normal, like as a NGO or as civil society, you're not getting to say a lot there either. So it's kind of, to me, kind of interesting how there's this industry need of we have to have a say, and it's kind of strange for me just to, as a side note. <laughs> okay, so two DPAs, uh, first the Belgian one and then the EDPS, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm the Burkhardt Belgium Data Protection Authority. Um, I can underline the lack of, of cooperation. I will mention two uh, examples. Um, the SWIFT case, we were confronted as the Belgium Data Protection Authority with this case. Um, it was very difficult for us to find a solution in the combination with the other data protection authorities. We were lucky that at that moment um, the president of the Working Party 29 was uh, collecting a standpoint, a standpoint from the whole Working Party 29 who have was given a lot of uh, not only moral but uh, backing on that. But at the end we did it alone. Um, the second uh, was already mentioned by David. It was the Google Street View. Uh, well, it was the Belgium Data Protection who was volunteer to coordinate the whole uh, um, action. It was a disaster. It was a disaster also because the whole system of the Working Party 29 is not fit for it. It's not made for a, a, a global cooperation on short term terms because if you 
or working every two, three months that you see each other here in Brussels and you are uh, only with one or two uh, delegates from every country who is not involved, who is not working on the case, but who is only a translator uh, on what was done on, on, on the field. It's very difficult. So I think that, uh, and that's a manco in uh, handicap in the new proposal, that we really need on the European level a very good uh, system that for, for this cooperation and for international uh, working uh, together. And it's still, uh, it's, uh, it's not available. I think we have really uh, with all the information that we get now, with the experience also of Max Krems, uh, we have really to, to work on it, on to, to elaborate such a system. Okay, questions maybe? Yeah. Uh, just one sen sentence, and uh, unfortunately it's even rather to the comment that was before. Uh, Wojciech Wiewiorowski, I'm uh, assistant EDPS, uh, uh, but I also took part in some of the meetings with the uh, search engines. Uh, well, we, we shouldn't expect uh, that neither the DPAs uh, themselves uh, or uh, the group of Article 29 will prepare the technical guidelines of how to deal with the questions like that uh, on the level which will allow uh, to address each business model and each technical model that is used by the companies that uh, use the search engines. So we should not expect this kind of uh, general guidelines on technical measures because this is actually, it, it fairly depends on the business model that is used. Thank you. Someone would like to react before yeah, I move? Yeah, so just quickly, uh, maybe one comment we, um, on which we could maybe uh, start a reflection is maybe, um, you know, we would need some kind of different type of cooperation according to whether it is a kind of request for, uh, you know, uh, compliance or authorization or notification of a specific processing. Then you would have a need for specific type of cooperation for enforcement action because it's completely different. The case at stake is different. And, and I think like we need to make, be, make a distinction, which is not the case at the moment in terms of competence, uh, regarding how, we, uh, how the DPAs uh, cooperate together in order to address one question by the business for their usual day-to-day -day processing and the way they will cooperate for enforcement action. I, and I think these two um, separate uh, topics need to be addressed uh, in this way. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, other questions? Okay, the ladies in red and then, yes. Hi, my name is Christina Blasi. Um, I'm coming from the European University Institute and my question would go to Max. Um, so from, from your personal experience, would you say that some DPAs uh, were the majority or the main IT companies are located could suffer some big pressures from these big companies and would, they would at the end lose some impartiality in some of the privacy issues. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all totally the case. If you ask anybody in Ireland, all the lawyers, all the journalists you asked who they said, either the prime minister called them right away or they know what they have to do. That's pretty frank what people are telling you behind the scenes. I've never said that because I don't have any evidence for that. Um, that's the reason I'm quoting other people. Um, but if you really look at how we, the first time we have talked to the Irish DPA, um, I was told that what, if I'm kind of in my right mind to criticize their decision. Um, and we got a 15 minute talk that we are not to talk publicly that we don't like what they decide. Um, and there is a very, there's also a different, very big different cultural thing, and it was very good that you pointed that out before, because um, in Austria you can criticize the government if you feel like it. Um, in Ireland, not that much, <laughs> and especially in a very different tone. Um, and that was really something where I totally had the feeling that we have the problem right now for the big corporations, for the internationals, they're all sitting in Luxembourg and in Ireland. If you look down, pretty much everybody has now moved to Luxembourg or Ireland for tax reasons. And if you have a country that kind of advertises itself as a wonderful business place with low regulation and very little problems that you will ever experience with authorities, um, you kind of know where this thing is coming from. Also in Ireland, there's a structural problem of the DPA. If they, um, the only thing they can do is a so-called enforcement notice, 
which is a piece of paper saying, dear Facebook, please don't do that anymore, Kiss is your DPA. Um, it's not enforceable, it's not directly enforceable. Face, uh, the DPA would have to sue Facebook in courts to stick to their enforcement notice. So practically what the law in Ireland does is that the law is not directly applicable to you. It only is made applicable to you if you get an enforcement notice and then you can be sued if you're not sticking to it. That's like if you can park anywhere on the street and only if an officer walks up to you and says, you shouldn't park here. If you don't move the car until you, tomorrow, then you could possibly get a parking fine. That's kind of the legal structure you have right now, which pre pretty much invites companies to do whatever they do because nothing is gonna happen. Um, the other problem is that they lack the resources, they didn't have the personnel, they didn't have any lawyers, any technicians, nothing like that. Um, so there was really, the feeling you got was, get away, don't make any trouble here, we are trying to make a business here. Um, and that was very, very, yeah. Oh, easy to see. <laughs> so, so uh, if I may, at this point, I I hear that uh, basically people are well, some some people have experienced different problems when interacting with DPAs because there's different procedures in place within the different countries, different powers, different resources, and so on and so forth. So, the intention in the regulation is to uh, um, facilitate the co the cooperation between DPAs. There will be this consistency mechanism or one-stop shop or a certain number of things. There will be the EDPB. Uh, the objective is really to mutualize uh, the resources to be more efficient and respond in, in a more timely manner. So the, the question is, if we look to the future, uh, do you think that we have all the tools right now in the draft regulation to solve those problems that you're mentioning today, um, a better harmonization of the legal framework, more mutualization of the resources by DPAs, and in the end, a better service for the citizen. Okay, we will take a last question. I think there was one, yes, thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Matthias Schmiedl, Deputy Head of the Austrian Data Protection Authority. A short question that perhaps you might answer because nobody else, at least at the European level, does not want it to answer. Uh, we need to cooperate more between the DPAs, that's true, but if we want to cooperate in a, in a better and more efficient way, then we have to communicate with each other, which means that we have to understand each other. And now the cardinal question is, in which language or in which languages this cooperation should take place, bearing in mind that there are several countries in Europe that are very sensitive about the use of their national language, and bearing in mind that not all DPAs have the resources uh, and not, neither the resources nor the budget to, to, uh, to bear the translation costs. Okay, thank you very much for your questions, which give me the opportunity to advertise a little bit more the projects in the GRC we have about this simulation exercise. Uh, we are expecting, among other things, that the, the exercise will reveal maybe the challenge of language, as you just highlighted, uh, whenever you have to deal with uh, a pan-European data breach and whenever you have to communicate between each other regarding the, I don't know, the evidence you might find on, on, this, uh, on these breaches. One last word from the panelists. Uh, yes, Ignacio, David, no? Something you would like to highlight at the end? Well, uh, I, must, I must say I was uh, interested in the comment from uh, Willem about uh, the need for um, some better mechanism for cooperation. I mean, I'm glad to hear that because it just reinforces the need for the second FIDRA project. And, and, you know, we'll certainly be talking to you and, and other DPAs to see what, uh, what your thoughts are with regard to, uh, to cooperation in that, in that regard. I mean, it's... It's, inter it's an interesting comment to make um, at the European level, and certainly I mean, with regard to the language issue, I mentioned it in one of the slides that I, that I showed. It wasn't the first time, uh, it's not the first time that we've seen or had such a comment about uh, language difficulties. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is for that, but uh, I mean, it's, it, I think it is a real issue. Um, um, yeah, but yeah. Max, one word. Um, on the was one question you had, if everything gets better in the future with the, with the new regulation, it very much depends on the version of it. Um, if you look at the council's version, it probably doesn't get better. It would get very, 
partly worse. Um, Parliament's version looks good to me. But there's really parts, for example, Ireland has lobbied that they may impose a sanction if they feel like it. And this may, may be interpreted very differently in Ireland than in Austria. Another thing is, for example, the risk-based approach. In Ireland, pretty much everybody's excluded from the registration duty for the duty to notify because they're seeing as low risk. So there's a re regulation in Ireland in place by the minister saying that even health data is low risk and therefore you don't need to notify only if it's mental health issues, then it's risky and only then you have to notify. So for example, Google, Facebook, all of them are not even notified with the Irish DPA because they are seen as low risk. Um, so that's all the things that are gonna be really interesting on how it's gonna turn out and how it's gonna be implemented. Emmanuel? Yes, I mean, I think we are just uh, starting a, a journey, you know, on uh, cooperation between data protection authorities because uh, the first step for us, obviously, and that's what on, on what we focus today, uh, is that cooperation amongst the European data protection authority is not yet, you know, really working and we definitely need to improve. But, I mean, once we will have solved that problem, obviously we will come to the next one, which is already something we face every day, is the lack of cooperation amongst the data protection authorities worldwide. Because uh, as you know, I mean, all the data protection, uh, uh, sorry, all the, the processing which impacts uh, personal data are most of the time global and they have, uh, uh, you know, your data are processed in India, in uh, the US or wherever. And if you don't have any power as a citizen, or also as a company to enforce your rights against a company which which uh, is based or which is processing data uh, in, in a country out of the EU, then we can have the best cooperation ever amongst the European Data Protection Authority. I think we won't go very far. Gwendal, as a moderator, yeah, last Just one maybe to, to summarize and conclude, because uh, I think we've had very uh, different views in the panel, but I think everyone agrees that cooperation is, is essential in any case. It's important for the legislator because they put this in the, in the text and they're trying to formalize this. It's important for DPAs to be more efficient, uh, for companies because they need to receive uh, consistent, uh, and, 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 and consistent responses by DPA and uh, a kind of uh, legal certainty of what is going to happen. And of course for the citizens, and, and Max has been explaining this, and it's in a context where uh, it can be currently uh, today difficult for uh, a certain number of you to interact with uh, DPAs for different reasons because procedures are different because the languages are, are, are different in the, in the countries. And uh, cooperation is a very broad topic because we had examples about opinions, uh, enforcement procedures, interpreting uh, decisions by the court, uh, and, and best practices, uh, um, preparedness with the, the breach exercises mentioned by Ignacio. And it's all about, in the end, having a timely, consistent, and efficient response by DPAs so uh, uh, in the end, uh, data protection is, is better ensured in, in Europe. So the last word will be, uh, we, we've had examples that were mentioned today. Some of them, uh, that's good news, I think, are, are pretty old. We talked about Street View, we talked about Swift, and I also heard that things have been improving. They're far from being perfect today, but they have been improving a lot. So this is good news for on, on the DPA side. And hopefully with the regulation, if we're optimistic, things will be even clearer, simpler, and, and more efficient uh, to have a better cooperation uh, with DPAs. And that will be the words of the end, I would say. For, for Thank me. you, Gwendal. And I just would like to invite you to join me for congratulating uh, the speakers. Thank you very much.